And we are back, folks, another edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider. And boy, uh, if you could go back, rewind the tape to the final seven games of the season and the projection for what Michigan needed to do to put itself in, in position to not go into the Big Ten tournament nervous, four and three was the minimum. And if they continued their win-loss, win-loss pattern, they would achieve four and three. That is exactly what they did. Joining me as he does every single week to break down Michigan basketball in a way that you don't see anywhere else. A guy who wore the uniform, played at a high level, was a first round draft pick, played in the NBA for a decade before getting off into an outstanding broadcast career. And then, of course, moonlighting when it comes to this podcast, the labor of love covering his Wolverines with me, my friend Tim McCormick. Tim, how are you, my friend? I'm great. <laughs> hey, oh, man. Woo. man. Man, beating Ohio State on the road was so highly improbable from my standpoint, uh, especially without Hunter, I would have said unlikely. Um, I didn't really think that they were going to beat um, Ohio State, even if Hunter did play, just based on the mm -hmm. inconsistency. Um, and if you would have told me, that that Brandon and Caleb would be 0 for 15, I would have said, no way. I'm going to go start doing some yard work and getting ready for spring. Um, midway through the first 10 minutes, I um, I hopped on my elliptical and was just getting a little workout in. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I get superstitious. And like if the team's playing well, I'm not going to change my routine. Like sometimes I'll go sit in a different room or I'll change pace a little bit when the football games are going on or a basketball game, I, um, I, I ended up going on the elliptical for 90 minutes because <laughs> I, I didn't want to be the cause of us losing our momentum or losing. The, so um, I thought Phil Martelli was brilliant. He made the team believe that they could win. He provided a strategy, which was to play fast with no post game. Um, and remember, Hunter Dickinson is an All-American and, and will go down as one of the great big men in Michigan history. Um, I think I shared with you that Phil Hubbard and Roy Tarpley and, and Chris Weber and Juwan Howard are the best Michigan centers that I've seen live. And Hunter Dickinson's on that list. So I'm not, I'm not disparaging him at all, but it was just a new way to play. There was no blockage in the lane. Uh, middle pick and roll was wide open. They ran a play called double drag, which you see all the time in the NBA. Those are NBA sets. And I saw two things. Devontae Jones didn't see any resistance in the paint at all. He drove over and over and over again. Um, and then the NBA scouts love Moose's potential. Why? Oh, we saw it against Ohio State. He's a really good middle pick and roll player. We're talking the middle third of the court. Um, he he just played so aggressively and so hard. And when he can get to the point where he adds some strength and can finish a little bit better, he's somebody's first round draft pick. Um, I love so much what Terrence Williams did. He's improved as a shooter. Um, I think that Kobe Buffkin shot made me scream at the top of my lungs and jump off of the elliptical. Uh, and I and I think that he's going to be a major star. I, I mean. We could spend the whole podcast with me just talking about what I saw, but I want to bring you into what what was your response? I, I know you didn't yeah. expect that. Yeah, I didn't. I admittedly, uh, you know, take nothing away from, from those guys, but Hunter Dickinson is the focal point offensively, and we've seen this squad look rudderless. We've seen him look rudderless when Hunter isn't on the floor. So they were going to play without him an entire game. What was that going to look like? Who was going to take over? Devontae Jones answered the bell. I know we talked about before before this, Illinois being his best game. I think it was 25 points, 10 assists. A little bit overshadowed because they lost the game, right? So that was, you know, factor number one. And then number two, there were so many brilliant offensive performances on the other side. But this one stands alone. In his one-year Michigan career, this was his defining moment. It was his best game, and it's not even close. On the road against Ohio State, senior day, you got to have it because you needed to, to punch your tournament ticket, and Hunter's not there. Who is going to take control? And Devontae Jones 
gave them not just a guy who was going to get it, but willing his team. To me, that is what leaders do. Can you infuse your team not only with playmaking ability, like you make plays yourself, but can you infuse some belief, whether that's whether that's the swagger, some confidence, something that they don't have? Can you infuse that belief in them? And he gave them that in a big way. You talked about the two-man game. I was really impressed with how, how well he read that in his willingness and ability to turn down the screen. I don't know how often he did that. I don't recall him doing it very liberally at all when, when Hunter Dickinson is out there. I, I don't recall him just like, passing up a ball screen and say, I could go, I go the other way, it's wide open. He did that, I, I counted at least three times and made a great play. I thought it was a brilliant floor game for Devontae Jones. Yeah, I agree with that. And th this is a tough question. I, I think everybody knows that the best player and the most valuable player is all league standout Hunter Dickinson. But I, I started thinking, going into a big game, who's the second guy that Michigan couldn't afford to lose? And Eli uh, immediately popped up as that number two guy. But when you look at the production, I think you could say that over the last month, Devontae Jones has been Michigan's second best player from a consistency standpoint. And that's crazy to think when throughout a lot of this year, most fans were really upset. And they, they were. were saying, this guy's not as good even as Mike Smith last year. Not true. He's a better player than Mike Smith because he can pass. He can lead the break. He's an excellent rebounder as a guard. I take Devontae Jones. And, and his performance was gutsy because there was so much at stake with this game. Think about this. A loss to Ohio State, that's dire circumstances. That means their last nine games, it's gone win-loss, 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 win-loss. That's not great. And so that means they would have lost five of, of their last eight games and, and probably need two wins in the Big Ten tournament, which means, as you look at it now, you, you, you're probably going to beat Indiana, but do you really feel good about having to beat Illinois or one of the elite yeah. teams to go to the NCAA. I don't. And, yeah. and so because of the play of Devontae and his guys, the, the world of Michigan basketball feels a lot better. We can praise their toughness. We saw freshmen that, that stood up in a big environment, praised for the leaders that, that are guards. And I, I also don't want an Indiana loss um, on Thursday. If they do – you know, you, you still have a really good shot at it. Um, but I don't want to spend my weekend hoping that that mid-major conferences with at-large bids, that those teams all win. I don't want to spend my weekend that way. So just beat Indiana, and I think they will. Yeah, you you did, I, I thought, a, a great job of highlighting Phil Marcelli's <laughs> leadership. I think another sign of, we're talking about what leaders do, leaders sort of validate the input of the guys that they're leading, right? What do they do? What can they add to the equation to maybe fill in my gaps, to fill in my deficiencies? And, you know, Phil, he'll tell you. I talk to him every week, and he said, Man, I'm not the NBA X's and O's offensive guy. He said, that's, that's Howard. That's Howard Isley. And so when you see these NBA sets that you're talking about, that's, you know, Howard Isley's input sort of rising to the fore, which has been present all season, but it's more evident when Jawan isn't there because you, I mean, everything that you look at from an offensive perspective and Phil to tell you, he's a man, this dude, he's a, he's a, a menu of out of bounds plays talking about Jawan and he just, the way he sees offense is just next level. Same thing with Howard Isley and that's sort of rising to the fore. Another thing that's rising to the fore, Saudi Washington's input defensively, Tim, because they had a problem on their hands when it came to EJ Liddell. And it's not just that he gets every foul call. I mean, him to do gets every foul call, whether that's, you know, he hacks you and they don't call a foul on him or you breathe on him and they call a foul on you. That's just how it works with EJ Liddell. But he took them to school last time. You cannot come out with the same defensive plan that you exhibited last, that you employed last time out. And he hit you for 28 points. You better do something different. Tim McCormick, they came out, doubled him on the catch. And it disrupted his, not just him, they, they doubled the post. But really, that was an effort to throw him off of his game. And it worked brilliantly because he had 
maybe one of his most inefficient games of the season. I thought it was beautiful. And the, the, the way that they did it was pretty unique. Most teams, when they double the low post, come from a diagonal angle from the opposite side. There's, there's a lot of um, opportunities for help in that situation. But Michigan played their defender um, a third of the way up the court and then brought the double from the baseline. And it was almost like EJ would catch it and square up and say, okay, oh man, he's coming again. That that's that that's bad news. And he all of a sudden he became a passer. I think EJ Liddell is one of the best players in the Big Ten. And if Ohio State was a little bit better, there there's a good opportunity for him to be the MVP of this league. Um, but you know, when I watched that game, I get excited as a basketball student when I can learn new things. Um, and, and so what Phil did, and, and I, I know he's going to give a lot of credit to Saudi and to Howard, but, but he was the head coach yesterday. And what he did was brilliant on so many different levels. And I, I'd like to just run through a bunch of them. Um, number one, if you watch Ohio State, they've, they've got some, some young guards and some shaky defenders. I think they're a horrible atrocious pick and roll team, especially with Branham, who's a star player. He's the best freshman in the big 10, but, but they, they ran multiple high pick and roll sets in the middle third of the court with Johns and Diabate over and over. And all of a sudden Michigan was gaining confidence because they knew that Ohio state couldn't cover them. Um, and, and the reason is really clear. Not only are they not good defenders, but their whole game plan was set up to stop Hunter Dickinson. And so when he wasn't out there, they didn't have any time to adjust. Um, I also thought it was great the way that Michigan pushed the ball up the court in transition after makes and misses to try to play versus an unsettled D. They scored in a lot of different ways. Um, I loved the fact that, that Phil Martelli this week was calling for an outlier, okay? He's such a good interview. Um, from now on, Terrence Williams' nickname is the outlier, okay? <laughs> Look, I, I know that that Caleb Houston um, has star potential someday, but to me, there's a lot of games that I would just assume Caleb sit down and play Terrence Williams. He's a better defender. He helps on the glass. He understands his scouting report. He's got more experience. Um, I, I loved Terrence Williams' game. Um, another thing, out of timeouts, it, it was like a clinic. that they, they ran so many different sets that, that we haven't seen on a consistent basis, and they got good shots all the time. And, and I, just, I just wonder, um, you know, all of the things that the Juwan Howard, who's a student of the game, I, I think that he probably sat back and watched other people coach his team. I bet he learned a lot from the experience as well. Sam, I can keep going, but I, I, I value your thoughts too. Why don't you respond well, to some ideas? Yeah, so so I got it. I mean, Terrence Williams is a – he is proof positive of you can improve your shot. Like, you, yeah. you aren't – it's not one of those things where you are, which unless your form is funky, right? But it's not as simple as that. you. Are, you're either, you're, if you're a bad shooter, you're gonna stay a bad shooter. If you put the shots up, I think he said something like a thousand shots a day. Something some ridiculous for regular people, right? But if if this is your craft and you're gonna improve, it's a, you got to put in that kind of work. And he did it, and the evidence is there. He's a forty percent three point shooter. I mean, the stats don't lie. He was not only was he knocking down open threes. He was knocking down contested shots, too. And we've seen him do that at times this year. And I, I feel really confident now in saying by the time he, he ends his career at Michigan, I think you look at him in year four, he's going to be every bit the three-point shooter that Isaiah Livers was. And I don't know that many people would have said that with him coming in because it was a work in progress for him as a senior, right, as a shooter. He started putting up more threes as a senior in high school clearly wasn't a part of his game as a freshman, worked hard on it in the offseason, and the evidence of that work we're seeing right now. You add to it, and you see him trying it a little bit, Tim, where he's going to be stronger 
than a lot of, you know, if you put a three, you put a wing on him, he can back that guy down. He's getting that, trying to work on that little turnaround jumper. He adds that to his equation and becomes an inside out player. He's a guy that in year four is going to be a plus player. He'll be a plus player next year. But really as a senior, I think he could be a frontline guy and, and what you want to see from a four-year player. Can he be a leader of your team, not just in voice, but in, in, in production? I think Terrence Williams is on that trajectory. So, so a lot of our viewers may not like this because it's going old school, but I know being from Flint, like Wayman Britt, way back when uh, I started uh, following <laughs> Michigan basketball, he's the guy that, you know, Ricky Green and Phil Hubbard were the All-Americans. Wayman Britt did all the little things to make everybody better. John Robinson made everybody else better. And I know you hate this, but whether you like Brad Davison or not, like he makes their team better and he's all big 10 because of it. Um, you, you need guys that, that, you know, some, some games they may not get the ball out. They may not get shots, but they want to win and they'll be ready for whatever you need. Um, Caleb Houston, 0 for 10, 33 minutes, two rebounds. Michigan was better when Terrence Williams was on the court. So true. I agree wholeheartedly, but let me, let me give uh, Caleb a little grace for a moment. He played good D. He played right, good D. Right. right. Because Tim, and this is this is a point that as we've talked through the season, that I know I've harped on. I know you've talked about it. And talking to Phil, he sort of talked about you cannot let your – just in general, you don't want your defense to be connected to your offense, right? You're going to have some nights where you don't shoot. Your defense is about effort. It's about intensity. It's about focus and being connected. Those should be constants, but especially for this team. As inconsistent as they are offensively, they can ill afford to have defense be predicated on the ball going in the net. And this was maybe the most vivid example of Caleb Houston severing that cord. Because he was 0 for 10. I mean, it was not a good offensive night. And yet you look at him on the defensive end of the floor, and you can say this for the team. They didn't shoot great. It wasn't a, an, an epic offensive night. I mean, Devontae Jones had an efficient day, but they shot 40% from the field. They were decent from three-point range, but Ohio State outshot them. How did they make up the difference? Defense. They forced turnovers. They got – and not just – you know, Ohio State throwing the ball away, but like you said, getting down, raking EJ Liddell in the post, forcing Joy Brunk into a turnover. Caleb Houston, fast hands on the perimeter. They got 12 points off of turnovers, Tim. Defense was an, a key element of their offense in this game. It, that has to be, I hope, a big takeaway from this team coming out of that contest. How great was the block by Musa? I mean, he trapped in the corner and got to the rim. Um, I agree, and I, I I I appreciate you pulling me off the ledge with with Caleb because as a freshman, he's not the go-to guy. Um, he was not named on the All Big Ten freshman team, but he did play really good defensively. He had some steals. He he was in position. He contested shots. He got a really big block. So thank you. Thanks for reminding me about that because his defense was good. Yeah, you, you hope, though, that he can take some of that home shooting and take it on the road because this you, you talk about patterns for the for the team, right? His pattern is he shoots it much better at home when home games are over. So hopefully, you know, th that can come back around because you're going to have many nights, like you said, where you get zero points from a starter mm -hmm. in, one of your, in your, you know, one of your best perimeter shooters. I, I don't know how many more games they can win like that. So, again, hopefully it's out of his system as they get ready to play uh, Illinois, or Indiana. Excuse me. So I was looking for somebody to hug when Kobe Bufkin knocked down the three. There was, I was man. by myself. I felt man. lonely for the man. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, I was fired up when Kobe hit that shot. I said, That's cold. Yeah. There you go. Because uh, listen, he is a. You know, you you see the progress from Caleb defensively. And that's where – that's the kind of progress that Kobe is trying to make. And you can see the coaches kind of coaching him up. You can see him sitting them down. There have been some defensive lapses. He had a hero so, moment. Yeah. And, that's and what so it was. And, this, you know, 
yeah, yeah. This this was was a time where they, they had to have it. I mean, yeah. Devontae's on the bench. He's hurt, right? Yeah. And so how many times, and Tim, you've played the game for years. You were a freshman. I, I'm sure you've seen freshmen or a rookie, and you've seen rookies. They get on the court, and they just stand, they stand around. Or they go in the corner, and they just park. Uh, hey, maybe you pass it to me, but I'm not going to – I'm not looking for the opportunity. Kobe didn't just stand on the perimeter. He floated to an opening on the wing, and Eli found him. He was shot ready, rose and fired confidently. But the key, the key was before the shot. What his, the work he did, the subtle movement before the shot to create more space for them to have to close ground on and being shot ready – that made the play. Now you just got to rise and connect, and he was able to do that. Yeah, and and you may say, well, what move did he make? He was able to to get the sight line with Eli, and he could see where he where where K, um, where Kobe was standing was right in the path of a defender, and the defender knew what was coming, and by moving, it was the only place that Eli could have possibly thrown the ball, and so he's had his freshman moment. Now build on it. You know, I, I want to see him take a couple extra shots in the Big Ten tournament because I bet that he's going to start knocking some down. I I agree, provided that he is because what you cannot be, and I, I know this hearing coaches all the time, I know it talking to Phil every week. You you give up Olays to the rim, they're gonna sit you down. So the opportunities on the offensive end will be born of what he does, the work he does on the defensive end of the floor. Otherwise, those moments will be fleeting. They will be few and far between. Fortunately, though, you know, I think he gained some confidence. I think we've seen an uptick in how he plays on the defensive end of the floor. And I think the coaches likely gained some confidence in him from that moment as well, which should bode well for this team as they head into Indiana. So I'm curious, Tim, you talked about the adjustments versus Ohio State. I'm curious, if were, were there any others that you saw other than doubling the post, which was so effective, that, that you want to single out? And what, if any, of those adjustments do you think are applicable moving forward as they get ready to take on a, another bubble team in the Indi Indiana Hoosiers? Well, I, um, I, I think that the big adjustment that I think that we learned is that when Hunter's on the court, yeah, they use him in the pick and roll or he's on the left or right block. I'd like to actually see them try some offense where Hunter is spotted up in the opposite corner, maybe in the left corner and on the right side, they run that middle pick and roll with Musa and with DJ. And and if you need to, I, I, I think that Hunter can knock down threes as well as anybody on the team. He never gets to shoot threes from the corner. I'd love to see that. And, and also, I think that a defense, especially Indiana, can get locked into Hunter on the left block, Hunter on the right block, Hunter with a double drag up top, Hunter with a high pick and roll. You know, I, I think it would be good to give other guys an opportunity. And Devontae Jones' ability to not use the pick and roll and get right to the rim was fantastic. It was. So, so, yep. so maybe, maybe we're going to see Hunter Dickinson spotted up a little bit more. And then the other thing is he can time it up and crash the offensive boards from the corners as well. Yeah, this is going to be a, a desperate team that they face. I mean, both teams really, uh, they, they need, both teams need a win Thursday. So on Michigan and Indiana, but Indiana needs it even more. Like there's no way, I don't see a way if they don't win Thursday, they, they can't be in the tournament. I mean, it's been a, they've been on the struggle bus here of, of late. I want to say, in their last nine games, I, I tried to count it up before we came on. I think it's the last nine. Eight, they're two and seven, two and seven with their only wins coming against Maryland at home and then on the road in Minnesota. But everyone else has beat them down. I mean, you had a suspension, some suspensions mixed in there. This has been a team that's been circling or, you know, kind of circling the drain since uh, you know, that high water mark when they beat Purdue back in late January. I, I think it's a really good matchup for Michigan. There's a reason they've won two of nine is because they're not very good. Uh, I think they'll be desperate. I think that they'll play well for a half, um, but they're nine and 11 in the big 10 and they need wins in a big way. Uh, the, the one game 
that they played. And I went back and looked at some of it. Michigan won by 18 at Assembly Hall, which is never an easy place. Hunter had 25. Um, it was Michigan's best three-point shooting on the road this year. They made 11 threes. Yeah. Um, they won the rebounding battle big. I think that the key, you, you talked about what adjustments they learned from the Ohio State game. Here's one. I think you treat Trace Jackson Davis like E.J. Liddell. Um, they have a lot of similarities in their game. And so I, I would, I would show him a double team. Um, I would, I would give some help to Hunter Dickinson and make him a passer early. I just, I don't think that they have good shooters on the perimeter. Um, they can roll defense. I would go under every time and see if those guys can make a shot. I don't think they can. And so if Michigan keeps their turnovers low, I, I have no worries about this one. But if they do, then I have worries about the next one because Illinois, we oh, talked cool. about it. Yeah, I, I said it right after that game, man. If if Michigan has to play them in the Big Ten tournament, I can't pick Michigan to beat Illinois right now. Yeah. You know, and as much as I would love to. And, and this is not taking anything away. I don't want to make it sound like it's impossible. I mean, those guys could could certainly rise to the occasion. But if if they're going – like they were going when they played at Chrysler. I mean, that's the best team in the Big Ten, and I, I think it's, yeah, you know, I think it's by a, a decent margin. And that's even with Purdue being as good as they are. I, they're a more versatile team than than Purdue, and they play defense. That's why I said it. it's uncharacteristic Purdue team in that they aren't an elite defensive unit. But Illinois gets it done on both ends of the floor. They can get in your shorts on the perimeter. They have a man child in the post. Uh, I, they have more shooting than I anticipated them having to me. And, and if they're going like that, how do you defend them? Like, how do you, what do you do to slow them down? You can't go under screens because they can knock down threes. Uh, you switch on them. They're going to take advantage of your bigs. I, I mean, maybe you double the post. I mean, that, that might be your best bet. Try to turn Kofi into a passer because that's not his forte. You know, maybe let him get into a move and see if you can disrupt his flow doubling at that point. I don't know. But if they're if they're going from the perimeter, Tim, that's a tough cover. And not just for Michigan, that's a tough cover for anyone. So I'm going to play pros and cons with you, OK? I think that Kofi Coburn is the Big Ten MVP. Um, Wisconsin blew it for Johnny Davis. He got hurt, too. Um, Illinois' guards are too quick for Michigan's bigs. Uh, especially when you consider that Musa and Caleb can't match up very well with their small guys. Um, now, since since we're gonna we're, we're this is a Michigan basketball podcast, let me make a couple of arguments though why it wouldn't shock me. Okay, number one, Illinois has the double buy, Michigan has the single buy. So sometimes it's a little bit of an advantage you get into the feel good zone because you thump somebody like Indiana. You, you pump your chest, you feel good about yourself, and it's a different environment. Sometimes it takes a little while. Um, also, Illinois has been walking around, big man on campus, everybody patting them on the back. It's easy to relax. We've seen that as well. No one would have thought that Wisconsin would lose to Nebraska and Illinois would get a share in the number one seat. Okay, so they could relax. Number two, what about the Juwan Howard factor? Mm -hmm. You know that he gave a motivational speech like none of us have ever heard when he got back in the locker room with his boys about what he wants to do, what he learned. There's going to be an infusion of excitement and enthusiasm. Also, Hunter Dickinson needs to spend the whole game yelling and screaming and pumping his chest and staring at Brad Underwood, at whatever it takes in that <laughs> game. Hunter Dickinson is like 30% yeah. better when when he wants to be the villain um, so that's an opportunity too and also we've seen teams that that are our favorites relax a little bit this time of year in the conference tournament so even though illinois is a team that i can't pick against i don't like them at all but but there are some signs that maybe just maybe you know michigan could be ready to go in this one and if they do, I like their path. And look, I'm not saying that this is a championship team. Let's be clear. When I when I raise this memory, 
But there was an Illinois squad that beat Michigan twice in back in 1989. Uh, I do remember that. <laughs> you know, I just and they got they got in the postseason and it was a different story. I'm sure that there were folks that I don't know if they can beat that squad. I mean, Kendall Gill, Marcus Liberty, Nick Anderson. I mean, they this that squad's loaded. Can they really uh, handle so them? That, and they got it done in the postseason. So, so that's maybe what you're just going with. Them. <laughs> <laughs> and again, not saying they're a championship team, but just talking about this one matchup. Tough to beat a team three times, right? No doubt, but the, yeah, things are things are set up interesting. I am um, I'm so excited. I um I, I think that that when when you look at teams that are going to be a tough out, I think Rutgers is going to be really good. Um, I, I like I like their team. I like Iowa. Michigan State gets a, a real break because they get a Maryland team that they just throttled at least for about thirty minutes of the game. And then they might take on Wisconsin without Johnny Davis. Who knows if he's going to play? Um, Purdue needs to upgrade their defense, but they've got the easiest route. I, uh, I've got a challenge, Sam, because I'm broadcasting the A10 tournament, and and so I'm um, I'm focused on my games, but I may have my iPad sitting up there that that has the Michigan have game to. up. There. Have to, have to. No, you know Rutgers. Rutgers is intriguing to me because they are a four seed in the big 10 tournament and yet they're still considered a bubble team. So like, here, here's, um, here, here's a really interesting fact. They're a bubble team and they actually have a disadvantage because at number four, they've got a double buy. They would love to play, you know, yeah. Nebraska or Iowa or Minnesota or something. They need some wins. And so they like, they, they could actually go up to somebody and say, Hey, look, how about if we switch spots? Like I want to <laughs> I want to play in the first day and get a couple of victories and some momentum because that'd be horrible. I don't know their exact route, but you know, to, to open up against a team that's got some momentum going a couple of victory, like that's, that's hard. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, you, you feel like maybe they are victims to a certain extent of Michigan state's downturn because they had that sequence back about a month ago where they beat Michigan State, Ohio State, Wisconsin, and Illinois in, in consecutive games, and all those teams ranked in the teens when they did it. And I was thinking at that point, oh, they're, that's, that's their tournament resume right there. But since then, I mean, Michigan State's still a good victory, but I don't know that it is seen as being as impressive as it was at the time. And then, of course, they go on the next three games to lose three in a row. But think about who those three losses were to. I mean, you lost at Purdue, you lost at Michigan, and then it was home against Wisconsin. That three tough games, and yet after they dropped those games, suddenly all the pundits would say, oh, this team is firmly on the bubble. I'm like, good grief. They lost mm -hmm. the three good teams after beating four good ones, and it's, you know, they're right back in limbo again. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. Um, Sam, before we go today, did you um, were, were you surprised that Caleb Houston wasn't on the all-freshman team? Wasn't I wasn't. Um I, I think that the difference for him, what they would say, and admittedly not looking at what the splits are like for the other freshmen. So uh, but this is just me sort of thinking through it, what likely went into uh the vote. His home and road splits are so I mean the gap is so wide, Tim. But for the game down in Assembly Hall. Can you think of a noteworthy road performance for Caleb? And he was good. And that, that maybe that bodes well for this matchup with Indiana, right? That he was really, really good. He shot it well down at Assembly Hall. But I can't think of another road game where, where he showed up uh, in a huge way. And I think that probably was something that weighed into, uh, you know, him not making that team. Yeah, I am. Um... I I have not lost confidence in his long term potential. I think John Sanderson is going to have a, a great deal of of um, of a game plan for for Caleb this summer. I think he's going to look completely different next year. I think that he is going to be a, an above the rim player. I'm projecting that he's not going to be in the NBA draft. I think he'll come back, and and the reason I think that that he should is i'm going to throw out a name for you and they're not completely the same but dj wilson 
Um, DJ Wilson, same size, really good shooter. I think DJ is actually a better athlete right now than Caleb. And you're you're not going to see DJ Wilson on any NBA roster today. When you get to the league, it's very important that your game is developed, that you're confident, that your body is 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 what it needs to be. And so, um, you know, Caleb's doing what he he should do. He's helping Michigan win. He's having some big ga- big games from time to time. But his upside is so much better if he continues growing in Ann Arbor. Yeah, Devontae Jalen Wilson. He was. Uh... Yeah. An intriguing, yeah. uh, you know, uh, an intriguing front line because he was such a bouncy athlete. I think he, better raw athlete. Sanderson, Sandman made him even better. Uh, but what the guys that I like to look at when I when I talk about Sandman's work is the guys that weren't bouncy coming in. I, I remember being at a camp and, and this is no disrespect intended because he's a ball player. But I remember being at a camp and watching Tim Hardaway get stuck on the front of the rim trying to dunk a basketball. I'm t- I was like, man, whoo. <laughs> you know, that's that's going to be tough. And by the time he left Michigan, I mean, he's I mean, he's dunking over people. Nick Stauskas. Nick Stauskas wasn't a bouncy guy, right? He wasn't driving and dunking on people. By the time he left, you know, he'll cross you over, get to the rim, and, and rain it on you, you know, yamming on you uh, it, like you wouldn't think was possible three years prior. So I can see Jalen Wilson, who is a, he's not a great athlete. He's a decent athlete adding some real bounce and not only being more effective because, you know, when he drive, when he puts it on the deck, seems like it's pretty easy to sort of knock him off his dribble a little bit. That's not going to be as easy once he gets stronger, but then can he get to the rim and finish? So what do I mean? You hear, I say finish. That's not a layup. That's you, put some, you put some bass in your voice on that. And I, I didn't know it, I didn't know that DJ was Devontae, but he's still my second favorite Devontae. I, I've got yeah. a favorite on the team right now. Listen, so, I want, so this is the deal, Tim. There are a lot of Devontae's. You got Devontae Jones, uh, Devontae Wilson for Michigan, Devontae Adams in the pros. There are a bunch of different Devontae's. And so just like you see a bunch of Jalen's in the early 90s, all those Jalen's were named after Jalen Rose, period. I don't know if it is Jalen before Jalen Rose. Same era, there's an R&B group that called Jodeci, and there's one of the members of the group, his name is Devontae. And I'm telling you, all of these kids with the name Devontae, their moms or their dads, their parents, we're Jodeci fans, and they named him Devontae. I'm telling you, you asked Devontae uh, Jones, you asked Devontae Wilson, you asked Devontae Adams, ask them, the, uh, ask them if their parents, if they love Jodeci. They, I'm telling you, that's where the name came from. So, you know what? There's, there's very few Sams and Tims around. I don't, I don't know what we did wrong. But there's no <laughs> Sams or Tim. So look at right. one week from now, we're going to have our bracket, and we're going to be talking. Make, make a prediction for me. How, how does Michigan do in the Big Ten tournament? And what seed so, do they? So I'm going to give you what my head says, and I'm going to give you what my heart says. Uh, my And I'll go to my heart first. My heart says they can, they have the tools to to go on a run. Now, they haven't put together, you know, three straight games, all se- four straight games all season. So that would be an, an outlier. But I look around the Big Ten, and they could beat everyone. The one team that gives me a hiccup in a roadblock is Illinois. That's the one squad I look at, and I haven't solved the matrix. I don't know how you solve that puzzle for, for this team. That's more of a hope that they're going to run. What do I think will happen, though? I think they beat Indiana, and I think they lose to Illinois. I Agreed. think, But I think in the end, I think that's enough to get them in the tournament as a 10 or 11 seed. Yeah, I, I think that's a good call, and, and I would love them to be at a 10 or 11 seed. Uh, because I think a lot of these guys are going to come back, and I think they can build something special next year. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely th- – I think Caleb is coming back. The question will be – and you sort of touched on this last week, Tim. So this is – you know, we we talk about homework. I need you to kind of talk to your people, talk to your scouts, do some digging about, you know, what's the buzz? What are NFL, NBA scouts sort of saying? And is there a feeling that it's a real possibility that – Musa, Devontae, Hunter. I hadn't heard anyone talk about the possibility of Hunter coming back until you mentioned it last week. 
is that are these realistic sort of dreams for a Michigan fan to have? That's that's some of homework. It might be a couple of weeks worth of homework, but that's what we need from, from you, Tim McCormick, with all your connections. Got to see what the word is on those fronts. I'm on it, Sam. I'll, I'll have that for you next week. All right. That'll do it, folks. Next time we come on, we'll be talking, recapping the Big Ten tournament, looking ahead to an NCAA tournament, which hopefully will be including Michigan. That will be on the next edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider. 